Um, so our next uh, panel is titled Science, Objects, and Gifts. And this uh, grows, grows out of the, uh, our last graduate student workshop um, in a way that we are thinking, uh, and this is what Catherine introduced uh, with Zovinar and Marie Baronian to Armenian studies, is the concept of materiality to Armenian studies. And our chair is um, Anna Maria Vinea, and she might be um, unfamiliar to, to some of you, um, uh, but whoever has participated in the graduate student workshop should know her already. Um, she was a postdoctoral fellow here at the, uh, uh, for the Michigan Society of Fellows, which is a very prestigious award. And she was located in the Department of Near Eastern Studies. And she's an anthropologist working on medical anthropology and the anthropology of Islam. And I'm going to pass the torch right to you. Okay. Yeah? Thank you. Um, so thank you all for being here. Uh, so Melanie, thank you very much for inviting me. And um, as Melanie asked me, I am supposed to have basically two persona here of a chair and a discussant. So first, as a um, chair, I would like to introduce the panelists uh, in the order of their presentations. So first, we have Chris Shekelian from Krikor and Clara Zorab Information Center. Uh, who will present a paper entitled A Single Nature of Two, Armenian Christology and the Materiality of Science. Then we have Sebu Aslanian for UCLA, um, who will base his presentation on his forthcoming book, Early Modernity and Mobility, Port Cities and Printers Across the Armenian Diaspora, 1512 uh, to 1800. And we will uh, end with Bahe uh, Sa Sahai Kia. Yes. From University of Michigan Dearborn, whose paper is entitled Diaspora and Materiality, Cultural Objects as Signifiers of Diasporic Present and Permanence. So I will give the floor to Chris first. I don't have a present uh, PowerPoint, but I'm going to come up here because otherwise I'll probably hit Anna because I'm, I'm motion quite a bit when I talk. Um, for, first and foremost, I, j I just want to say thank you to um, pretty much everybody in the room. This is an incredible uh, group, and my year as a Manugian postdoctoral scholar not that long ago was um, really incredible and wonderful and formative. Um, I think the University of Michigan Armenian Studies program here is, is pretty, pretty special. Um, I first encountered it as a graduate student uh, at one of the graduate student workshops, and I remember walking away thinking, if this is what Armenian Studies is, then, then count me in. I'm in. Um, so the, the, the vision of what Armenian Studies is and can be that has been fostered at this institution, I think, is expansive, uh, interdisciplinary, as we've, as we've heard, and, and just really wonderful. So you know, thank you to everybody here that has, has made it such a place. Um, some of you have heard kind of a little bit of what is in here. I'm, it's, it's taking a, a slightly, you know, one more turnaround to think more explicitly about materiality. Um, and everybody should make sure they have their coffee because we're just going to do some light afternoon philosophy, basically. So I apologize ahead of time for that. It's like nap time, not philosophy time, but sorry. So uh, a single nature of two, Armenian Christology and the materiality of the sign. We do not call the things that God has put on earth for our enjoyment vile, nor do we spurn them as disgusting things, insists Vertanas Kertor, a seventh century Armenian theologian writing in defense of icons and the use of painted images in the church. Pigment and paint, though made of base materials like clay, cannot be vile or disgusting because they were made by God. And nothing made by God could be vile or evil in its own right. Corruptible, perhaps susceptible to the fallen free will of humanity, but not evil or vile in itself. Kertog, writing in defense of images, also pens a powerful defense of the material world, of materiality itself. Now, Christianity has both a long, I would say, actual history, but certainly a long uh, reputation of denigrating the earthly, the material, and the embodied. Powerful strains of Christian thinking from early Gnostic and Manichaean tendencies deemed heretical, to the most extreme forms of medieval asceticism, to contemporary calls to flee the world, have gone beyond the biblical injunction to keep your treasures in heaven 
and instead insisted that the spiritual world is the only important one. Matter and materiality, the earthly and the bodied, do not matter. Lynn White Jr., writing about the roots of our ecological crisis, lays the blame for a cavalier and overly functional approach to nature and the environment squarely on this Christian tendency to denigrate the earthly in favor of the spiritual. So Kertog's defense of the material, of the things that God has put on earth, is striking and consequential. This defense and the insistence on the beauty and enjoyment of the material world is part and parcel of the Armenian theological tradition, one that, around the same time Kertog was writing, solidified its position vis-a-vis -vis the Council of Chalcedon. Developing out of both Greek and Syriac strange of Christianity, heavily influenced by the Christology, that is the sort of reflection on who Jesus Christ is, uh, the, the Christology of Cyril of Alexandria, while retaining exegetical insights from the rival Sea of Antioch, Armenian Christianity over the centuries has developed a unique expression of the Christian confession. In what follows, I will argue that Kertog's defense of the material world sits squarely within that unique Christian expression. Moreover, without reinscribing one of the most consequential theological divisions in Christianity, I will suggest that the Miaphysite Christology helps which is sort of the, the, the Cyrillian Armenian Christology, helped shape an Armenian Christian attitude to both materiality and semiotics, that is, the science of the signs. Finally, I argue that the sources and theological discussions that constitute this Armenian Christian attitude can productively be deployed in contemporary debates about materiality, semiotics, and particularly in uh, this interest in the materiality of the sign. So first, I want to be clear that Armenian Christians are not somehow unique in their affirmation of the material world. The Christian denigration of materiality is only one strain, albeit a, a pretty dominant strain of Christian thinking. While a preference for the spiritual has biblical precedence, and the uh, eschatological promise of Christianity demands a certain emphasis on the world to come, a full-throttled rejection of the earthly, the material, and the embodied is arguably, from the perspective of you know, so-called small orthodox Christianity, heretical. In On the Incarnation, St. Athanasius's fourth century statement of orthodox Christology in the face of Arianism, the Bishop of Alexandria makes it abundantly clear that the entire economy of salvation, the efficacy of the Christian faith, depends upon Jesus Christ being fully human. God become man, or truly human, I should say. Without the incarnation, the embodiment of God as the person of Jesus Christ, the material existence and earthly ministry of the incarnate word of God, there is no Christian salvation. This central theological argument was made at a time when Christians were still figuring out the answer to the question, who is this person, Jesus Christ? Athanasius's answer insisted on the embodied and material nature of Jesus Christ in the face of detractors who thought that Christ was merely a man who assumed the nature of God at his baptism or that he was some kind of spectral projection of divinity. These other answers, deemed heretical by all ancient Christian churches, depended on a denigration of the earthly and material. God, they thought, would not dirty himself with the earthly nature of humans. Athanasius's orthodox answer prefigures Kertog's insistence that nothing God puts on earth should be considered vile. A wholesale rejection of the earthly and the material from this orthodox and Athanasian viewpoint amounts to a heretical rejection of the incarnation of Jesus Christ and therefore the entire economy of Christian salvation. Over the centuries, most branches of Christianity have tacked between clear Athanasian orthodoxy and a tendency to emphasize spiritual discipline and the world to come. Arguably, the stronger emphasis on the spiritual at the expense of the worldly enters Christianity through Neoplatonism, whether from Philo of Alexandria or a Cappadocian synthesis of classical learning with Christianity. These debates about the philosophical underpinnings of early Christianity are well beyond the scope of the paper, and some of these discussions revolve around misguided attempts to delineate an authentic Christianity uninfluenced by Plato or Plotinus. Nonetheless, just as different branches of developing Christianity, different schools of thought, such as Alexandria and Antioch, put the classics to varying uses, they also developed different subtleties of answers to the question, who is this person, Jesus Christ? Ultimately, uh, the decisive break came with the Council of Chalcedon in 451 AD, with its definition of Jesus Christ as one person in two natures, God and man. Though the Chalcedonian Christians also accept St. Cyril of Alexandria as a saint, 
It was the non-Chalcedonian churches who rejected this, this formula, um, who are best described as Miaphysite Christians, who lean most heavily on Cyril's formula, which is one incarnate nature of the God Logos. Totally clear, right? This theological difference between Chalcedonian churches, what are known as the Eastern Orthodox churches, such as the Greek or the Russian churches, as well as the Catholic church, and the Miaphysite churches, to say monophysite is a, is a bad word, um, it's a mean name to call people, Miaphysite churches, which in addition to the Armenians includes the Coptic, Syriac, Ethiopian, Eritrean, and Malankaran Indian churches, this difference has perhaps been overblown. In the 20th century, a group of ecumenical scholars from the Eastern and Oriental, this is another term for the Miaphysite uh, Christians, Oriental Orthodox churches, they found that their respective Christologies were in basic agreement, albeit expressed differently. Therefore, I don't want to reinscribe this theological difference as an ontological chasm. Rather, I think it is fair to suggest that a millennium of considering this difference to be important, with polemical tracts and liturgical anathemas on both sides, has resulted not in irreducible dogmatic disagreements, but rather different emphases. Taking the central figure of Christianity to be mystical, unmixed nature of human and divine, rather than one person in two natures, surely has consequences. For the definition of personhood, for the idea of what constitutes nature, and ultimately, for the way one interacts with the world. In this, we reach my own disciplinary training and a deeply anthropological insight. Not only the way we talk about the world, but the way we interact with the world varies from place to place, tradition to tradition. A universal humanity where particular expressions matter, indeed the very idea of matter, nature, or human exceptionalism may differ from place to place or time to time. While the old Boazian cultural relativism has come under fire in the discipline, and anthropologists fall along a spectrum of biological universalists and cultural relativists, the idea that cultures, traditions, life worlds vary between populations with profound consequences not only for discourse but action, for the very understanding of action or humanity or matter and materiality remains a central tenet of much anthropological inquiry. Its most recent articulation is known as the ontological turn, an effort to describe other kinds of realities beyond us. That's a quote from Cohn. As the name suggests, the ontological turn is deeply concerned with what Kant called the thing in itself and dovetails with related theoretical debates in anthropology and beyond. As Lily Chumley points out, the ontological turn emerged simultaneously with an interest in materiality. And she, she writes, under the banners of ontology and materiality, scholars in the humanities and social sciences have increasingly turned their focus to non-human entities. In tandem with this trend, therefore, we, can, may, we, we may mention the increasing attention paid to environmental concerns and the debates over the so-called Anthropocene. Today, across disciplines, there is a broad concern with matter, materiality, environment, the earth, and ontology. Chumley notes that the literatures on ontology and materiality share a welcome interest in finding alternative foundations for ethics and politics. Such an impetus may well explain the ontological and material turn in the social sciences and humanities. In an age of anxiety over human-driven changes to the planet, new ethics and politics are indeed a welcome interest. Study of, of Orthodox Christianity have followed, and in some cases even led these trends. The ecumenical patriarch of Constantinople, Patriarch Bartholomew I, has earned the epithet the Green Patriarch. Eastern Orthodox theologians object to the white thesis mentioned above, arguing that however approximate for the Christian West, this account of Christianity cannot possibly be reconciled with Orthodox Christian history. Rather, Orthodox theologians assert a long-standing concern with the environment that is constitutive of Eastern Orthodox Christianity. This is a quote. For Orthodox Christian philosophers and theologians, the concern for the environment is not a form of superficial or sentimental love. It is a way of honoring and dignifying the reality of our own creation by the hand and word of God. Similarly, Orthodox theologians and scholars of Orthodoxy have joined the material turn in the social sciences and humanities. Icons, incense, and liturgy, material instantiations of Orthodox Christianity that are often seen as its distinctive feature, have increasingly come under the scrutiny of scholars and theologians. St. Vladimir's Orthodox Seminary, one of the premier centers of Orthodox Christianity in America, recently hosted a conference on Byzantine materiality. Theologically speaking, the incarnation of Jesus Christ is front and center for both of these concerns. 
As Christoph Gies puts it, orthodox environmental insights come under three categories, icons, liturgy, and asceticism. Concerning icons, an aspect of orthodox theologic theology shared with those working in orthodoxy and materiality, Christoph Gies writes, the divine incarnation is at the very heart of iconography, and the world of the icon offers new insights into reality. Opening up new insights into reality is nothing if not a theological grappling with ontology. Crucially, Chris of Geese connects this environmental and ontological concern to the divine incarnation. Athanasius had already discerned the connection between Christology and materiality in his insistence that the doctrine of Christ's incarnation and the orthodox belief in his full humanity entailed an affirmation of the earthly, embodied, and material. A near contemporary of Vertanas Kertor, St. John of Damascus, writing the most famous defense of icons, connected the incarnation to the defense of icons and thus again to materiality, arguing that I do not venerate matter, I venerate the fashioner of matter, who became matter for my sake and accepted to dwell in matter and through matter worked my salvation, and I will not cease from reverencing matter through which my salvation was worked. In other words, the doctrine of incarnation and allied debates about Christology are directly related to questions of the material world, whether this means the earthly, an abstract materiality, the body, the real, or the environment. Not just Christian theology, but specifically the doctrine of the incarnation are implicated and imbricated in debates about materiality. If this is the case, then the self-described epithet of the Christian East to describe the Eastern Orthodox Church Orthodox Christianity is in basic agreement with Roman Catholicism and the so-called Christian West when it comes to one of the most fundamental tenets of Christianity, that is the incarnation. What I'm saying is that both the Eastern Orthodox churches and the Roman Catholic Church are Chalcedonian Christians. Both branches of Christianity accept this Chalcedonian formula of two natures in one person for an alternative approach to Christology, which, given the argument above, should come with a concomitant alternative approach to materiality we must turn further east from the Christian East to the Christian Orient and explore the Miaphysite Christology of the so-called Oriental Orthodox churches of which the Armenian Apostolic Church is one. The starting point for Miaphysite Christology is the work of St. Cyril of Alexandria. If his predecessor at the See of Alexandria, St. Athanasius, developed his Orthodox insights against Arius and the Arian heresy, Cyril's main opponent was Nestorius, who, among other things, refused to call St. Mary the mother of God. In Against Those Unwilling to Confess the Theotokos, Cyril connects the epithet mother of God, Theotokos, or in Armenian, Asvazadzin, to a full confession of Christ's divinity. Again, like Athanasius, Cyril recognized that the economy of salvation depended on Christ being both fully God and fully human. Nestorius seemed to separate the human and divine, material and spiritual, we could say, parts of Jesus Christ, so thoroughly that he preached two distinct Christs. Though, you know, it's important to say that with many so-called heretical thinkers, where we have their texts are in basically polemical arguments against them that are quoted, so we should, I think, always kind of be careful when we're, when we're talking about heretical arguments because we, we very rarely have a full, you know, Arian or Nestorian tract. Cyril developed his formula of one incarnate nature of the God Logos to defend against this separation and what he felt were drastic consequences for the economy of salvation. At the Council of Ephesus in 431, Cyril won the day and Nestorius was anathematized. The controversy continued to rage, however, and in 451, the Council of Chalcedon adopted its formula. Though the rejection was not as clear-cut or immediate as subsequent histories would have it, the so-called Oriental Orthodox churches did eventually reject this formula that was developed at the Council of Chalcedon, finding the division of two natures, even in one person, too close to Nestorius's earlier position. Perhaps the continued relevance of Nestorian Christianity in the Persian Empire was part of this rejection. Whatever the reason, all of the or Oriental Orthodox churches developed a distinct Christology grounded in Cyril of Alexandria's position. Each of the autocephalous churches have developed Miaphysite Christology in their own way, but each retains the central mystical impulse of Cyril. In the Armenian case, Stepanos Sunetsi, though writing well after the debates about the council, offers a succinct statement of the Armenian apostolic position, which I will just read here quickly as a, a very adequate statement of, of Miaphysite Christology, just so we sort of put that out there uh, somewhere. A godhead, in one, in, one, a godhead one in three and three in one, 
One of these three is the Father's word, who was born of the Father before all time in order to reconcile the creation with the Father, descending from heaven through the archangel's giving of the good news into the holy and spotless version he became incarnate truly and was made God and man. Just as he was true God, so also he became true man, a single nature of two, without confusion and without division. Although he became incarnate, he was inseparable from the Father, bearing all human passions except for sin. This is Sunitzi's statement of Christology that I think you know, holds up very, very nicely as a statement of, of doctrine for the Armenian Church. So we're going to note here two important aspects of, of Miaphysite Christology. First is the simultaneous insistence that there is neither confusion, mixing, nor division. If there's a single nature that is God Logos, it's important to clarify that these two are somehow to be distinguished, even if they are not distinct natures. The other aspect is the identification with Jesus Christ as the Father's word. This is the Logos in Cyril's incarnate God Logos. Again, Armenians and Miaphysite Christians are not unique in their use of calling Jesus Christ the Logos. This comes directly from the opening lines of the Gospel of John. In the beginning was the word, and the, the, the word used is Logos. The lexical item that translates word is exactly the Greek logos, a term that had already been used by Philo of Alexandria and whose philosophical pedigree in Platonic and Stoic thought predates the evangelist's use of it. With this theological identification with the person of Jesus Christ as the word of God, specifically using the already philosophical term logos, Christology comes into contact not only with contemporary discussions of materiality, but also semiotics, the broadly defined science of the sign. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time with this, although I'm going to do a little bit less with this because many people sitting here have heard me talk about semiotics and Christology before. Um, but we, we can sort of turn back to John of Damascus, this defender of icons, who we see kind of makes this link explicit, right? The incarnation is, uh, is about uh, the way an icon works. So Quoting St. Gregory of Nyssa, John argues that the veneration of icons is not idolatry because we do not speak either to the cross or to the representation of the saints in this way, i.e. it's not idolatry. They are not our gods, but books which lie open and are venerated in churches in order to remind us of God and to lead us to worship him. He who honors the martyr honors God, to whom the martyr bore testimony. He who worships the apostle of Christ worships him who sent the apostle. So this is an explicitly semiotic and representational argument, one that John develops in relation to making present of the Godhead through the incarnation. Christological concerns speak not only to contemporary concerns about materiality then, but to semiotic and representational ones. So what, what John of Damascus is saying, right, is that the icon, and this is where in semiotics, um, I'll just maybe do this quicker, where in, where in Persian semiotics explicitly, Perse takes the idea of the icon to talk about one of the ways that, that, that sign relations can work. And an icon is specifically a sign that presents the absent presence of something else. And we can see this actually in this theological use of what an icon is in, in John of Damascus, right? The icon, the physical painting, is not the thing that we worship. It is the presence that is made present of whatever stands behind it, whether that's an image of Christ or a particular saint or whatever it may be, right? So the icon is, is a, a, a semiotic form that makes representation possible by presenting the, the presence of something that, that is, is absent. And Peirce, who you know, is arguably the most sophisticated originator of, of different semiotic traditions, Saussure is sort of the other kind of uh, father figure in contemporary semiotics. Peirce's is arguably more uh, sophisticated and interesting. The, he takes on this language of the icon, and, and I think it's, you know, it's not... Um, it's not coincidental that this is what he uses to describe this particular representational logic. So the most famous of, of Peirce's trichotomy of signs is this division of index, icon, and symbol. So these are ways that things can signify. Through likeness, the icon, through pure convention, the symbol, or through a pointing relationship of some kind, right? So the, the, uh, uh, the, the, the sort of the windmill is a, is a good, uh, actually that's an indexical icon, but let's not do too much Peirce. Um, so as I've detailed elsewhere, as many of you heard, without making a strong causal argument, there's a distinct resonance between the tradition of thinking about signs and signifying relationships in Western Christianity and semiotic theorizing in the 20th century. So St. Augustine of Hippo develops a, a pretty explicit sign theory. And um, Augustine's thinking about signs and signification aligns more closely with sort of Caesarean semiotics, but I am not actually the first person to note parallels between Persian semiotics and St. Augustine. Um, 
Somebody, Marcus, in 1957 writes, sign, representamen, object, subject, interpretant. This is Peirce's termi terminology, and it coincides closely with Augustine's. Peirce's definition of sign is equally close to that given by Augustine. A sign or representamen is something which stands to somebody for something in some respect or capacity. So this is the first point. Western thinking, theological thinking about signs, the logos and the incarnation, resonates with the sophisticated semiotic thought of C.S. Peirce. In addition to this resonance, recent work in semiotic uh, in linguistic anthropology or semiotic anthropology derived from Peirce's work has brought together interest in semiotics and materiality together in what could be called interest in the materiality of the sign. In addition to the most well-known division of index, icon, and symbol, Peirce's trichotomy of signs produces other categories of signs, the relevant one for this discussion being the quality sign. A quality sign represents through what he calls firstness a quality in the literature qualia, such as redness or roughness. As Chumley describes, qualia and quality signs invoke ontological categories, real, unreal, material, immaterial, bodily, mental, with social consequences. This imprecation of language in the material produces discourse on what matters, demonstrating the significance of qualia for ontological politics. This is Chumley. So, you know, I don't want to debate, you know, possibilities of outside of language or whatever, but what I want to point to is that this most current of linguistic anthropological thinking about the materiality of the sign, this interest, this is like a, a, a kind of very hip interest within linguistic anthropology is not just purse, but specifically thinking about quali signs, about qualia and the ability to talk about, you know, what is redness and what does it mean to make ontological claims through these kinds of material um, discussions. So here then is one compelling point of entry for an alternate conception of the sign, of logos, of who Jesus Christ is when Jesus Christ is taken about the, as the word of God. Christology as semiotics means that the Miaphysite Christology of the Armenian church offers different ideas about signification, especially with regard to the question of matter and materiality from the Chalcedonian re Christian reflection that arguably continues to suffuse philosophical thinking about language and signs. If we return to a comparison between John of Damascus and Vertanas Kertoch, we can begin to discern concrete ways that conceptions of sign and semiosis in the Armenian sources differ from their counterparts further west. We can tell quite a bit about a thinker's notion of signification and sign through certain characteristic anxieties. Webb Keen's work here at Michigan, among others, has detailed the characteristic anxiety of Western semiotics and philosophy, the anxiety over confusion between material and spiritual, between matter and idea. More specifically, the anxiety has to do with the pollution of the spiritual by the material. So not simply mixing, but the debasement of the spiritual by its contact with the material. Such an anxiety develops in tandem with a conception of signification where there's a relatively tidy pointing relationship from signified to signifier and where the ultimate value is placed on the divine or abstract side of the relationship. The aversion to multiple interpretations that many have seen as characteristic of a high modernism is this version of signification taken to the extreme. Hence, we can use the anxieties generated around signs as a heuristic, an indicator to help us understand and clarify conceptions of the sign itself. What then are Vertinus's anxieties? One anxiety relates to the debasement of matter, of the created world in general. How could pigments be vile, he asks, when they're created by God? On the one hand, the reaffirm, need to reaffirm the value of matter of the material world is one shared by all Christian thinkers. The tendency towards an asceticism that passes from a focus on the spiritual to the blasphemous s suggests that the world God created is somehow inherently evil as one shared across the divisions of Christianity. Yet Vertanes offers a wholesale rejection of the idea that pigments as matter, like any of God's creation, could be inherently evil. His concern is not with keeping the material and spiritual distinct, but from preventing the rejection of God's creation to court. So I'm going to um, just end. I'm going to skip here almost to the end. Um, and say that I followed this kind of more thoroughly to think about hermeneutics. Um, and the centrality of hermeneutics for social scientific disciplines. But different ideas about science, semiosis, and representation therefore lead to different hermeneutic tools. And thus, one contribution of Armenian studies to the wider academic community lies in the expansion of this social scientific toolkit, thinking around hermeneutics. Today, I want to end by reiterating that the Christological differences between Chalcedonian and Miaphysite positions have implications not only for scientific methods and hermeneutic practices, but for some of the most lively debates in the social sciences and humanities today those related to semiotics and materiality.
Whether a scholar is interested in only one or the other, or if they follow the lead of linguistic anthropologists into an exploration of materiality and semiotics together to qualia, quali signs, and the materiality of the sign, theological debates about Christology can be read philosophically to intervene in these contemporary discussions. All too often, theology is relegated to the sidelines in, this, in these debates. But if the ontological turn in anthropology has taught us anything, it is that ethnographic others, who despite the genealogical inheritance or the vague and sometimes blunt instrument of Judeo-Christian culture, can include Christians. <laughs> this means that we can find here in theology not only just curios in the cabinet of cultural life worlds, but genuine interlocutors in pressing philosophical debates with legitimate and accepted names like ontology. Given that perhaps the most pressing concern of our times, human influence climate change, abuts debates about materiality, matter, and how we conceive of the earthly and the natural, then Christology too matters. Armenian Miaphysite Christology, with its emphasis on the unity of divine and human, spiritual and material, offers a robust entry into these timely matters. Thank you. All right, uh, thank you very much, Melanie, for this wonderful invitation to be here at this special event. I'd like to thank the Manukian Foundation for uh, uh, continuously supporting and patronizing the Armenian, Armenian scholarship in general, and particularly the Armenian chair here. And lastly, I'd like to thank the Armenian Studies Program, and, and especially one of its former directors, Jirai Limaridian, for uh, choosing me as a postdoctoral fellow about 10 years ago when I was a much younger man and had just finished my dissertation. So I wanna mention that with special uh, emphasis because it was during my time here uh, for the one year that I was here that I was able to transform my bulky and somewhat messy dissertation. I was on economic history and the use of financial instruments across the Indian Ocean Basin into a slim and useful, uh, I think, book that went on to be published, and as a result of which, I was able to obviously land a job at one of your uh, competitor, one of uh, a competitor university to the south, uh, which constantly looks up north to inspiration, and uh, and with gratitude for allowing me to be there. So, uh, having discharged my responsibilities, I will. Uh, quickly jump into the, the nuts and bolts of my presentation. Uh, my talk today is, not a, is, is basically an attempt to summarize very quickly uh, my second book manuscript, tentatively uh, titled Early Modernity and Mobility, Port Cities and Printers Across the Armenian Diaspora 1512 to 1800. It's a study it's a socioeconomic study of 300 years of Armenian print on the basis of multiple archives on several continents. Uh, and uh, it examines the production of books in the Armenian script and the Armenian language in 19, across 19 different locations, predominantly in port cities where the early modern Armenian diasporic colonies or communities had sprung into existence. And so uh, my book relies on, my book relies on uh, methodology and conceptual insights that have been selectively uh, cultivated or removed from the toolkit of the French tradition of historical writing known as the Annal tradition and particularly from a sub-discipline within this larger school known as l'histoire du livre, which as you can see here, is represented by the publication of this iconic book in 1958 by uh, Lucien Fèvre and Henri-Jean Martin. Lucien Fèvre, of course, is the co-founder of the Annal School of his Historical Writing, arguably the most important school of history writing in the 20th century. And Martin, who was the real architect of this l'histoire du livre tradition, was a young disciple of his, 25 years old, who had published an article in Annal in 1952, which unleashed a whole new uh, way of looking at book history. So I attempt to engage with this tradition. I'm in dialogue with this uh, European scholarship, but unlike the European scholarship, what I do is 
I try to disabuse this methodological or uh, perspective from two things. One, a focus on Europe, Europe exclusively and on a Eurocentric kind of emphasis on printing as an exclusively European pres uh, privilege up until the 19th century when Islamic print rushes onto the scene. The argument has always been that, and it's been an argument from Lucien Febvre onwards until as recently as my colleague Niall Green's work, although he has changed his views since in the last few years, that print was an exclusively European endeavor, that it was something that could only be found in Europe, and if it was found overseas, it was found in a number of colonies that were extensions of Europe, where white Europeans printed for natives, usually uh, works of catechisms and so on. So what I tried to do is remove the focus from Europe to Ar the Armenian diaspora, and in doing so, I, I also tried to reorient uh, this Histoire du Livre tradition from a focus on national or continental units, focusing on Europe, to one that is global in scope, and for which I argue the Armenian tradition with its 1,000 colophons and very rich material of sources and uh, documents, particularly notarial records in numerous European archives, offers us fresh raw material and insight. So having said this much, let me quickly uh, let me quickly also say that the book uh, does not have one single overarching argument. There is no analytical argument that connects all the chapters together, and my book doesn't say this book will argue this. However, the book does have a three interlocking and self-reinforcing arguments, which are like spools of thread which bind together the different choirs of a medieval manuscript tightly to its spine. So I hope that these arguments are the ones that are, uh, that are present underneath the riches of the archival evidence that I examine. And these arguments are first the argument concerning the origin of Armenian print, the origin of the Armenian printing revolution. That is to say, why did Armenians in 1512 begin to grasp or grab the bull of European Gutenberg print technology by its two horns and harness it in service of their own needs. And here I advance, advance an argument on the basis of earlier scholarship where I look at the shift from scribal to mechanical reproduction. And I forward a thesis called the PPP thesis, which is basically Port City, Port Armenian, and printing connection where I look at how these three things, port cities, print, uh, print, uh, port cities printing, and uh, port Armenians interlocked with one another to facilitate the rise of Armenian print. The second argument that I make is an argument uh, that is a more, much more innovative than the first one. And it's an argument that is focused on the driving engine of Armenian book production. That is to say, what was it that drove Armenians in Armenian book production from 1512 to 1800? Is there, are there uh, one or two overarching driving engines that account for the multiplication of mechanical of books through mechanical reproduction? And I argue, yes, there is a driving engine, and that driving engine is called confessionalism. I will talk about this very briefly in a short while. And thirdly, I talk about the methodical nature of what I call the early modern Armenian printing revolution. So in the time that I have left, I wasn't, I left my, Quick. my, how many minutes? Three minutes. It's like three, four, ten minutes. Sorry? Almost like three minutes. Get my Fifteen minutes. Okay. I should have done yeah. it originally. Yeah. Okay. So in the time that I have left, approximately 15 minutes, <laughs> what I will do is very quickly go over an, uh, thesis number two and thesis number three, and then uh, wind down my converse, my discussion by returning to the last chapter of my dissertation where confessionalism and the printing revolution. I'm sorry? Oh, I'm sorry, a book, yes. Uh, it, it must have been so traumatizing that I'm still stuck in that originary position. My book, so the last chapter of my book where I combine confessionalism and the printing revolution by looking at the movement of Armenian print from the European port cities to port cities in the Russian Empire.
and also to a port city, my favorite port city, perhaps in the southeast of, our, of the world, that is to say in Madras, India, and I look at how confessionalism and the printing revolution kind of met each other in these two different locations. So what do we mean by, and here's of course a map of all the different locations, 19 locations, 17 are hands down print uh, port cities, 84% of the total output of Armenian books was produced in port cities, and of course there's a logic to this. It's not an accident or a coincidence. But I don't have time to go into it. Uh, my book will provide a, a thorough description and discussion of this, of this topic. So what do we mean by confessionalism, the driving engine of print history? By confessionalism, in the simplest fashion, what we mean to say is the sharpening and um, uh, the sharpening of differences in religious uh, identities, or more, more specifically, a process of making clear boundaries of religious difference between and among communities. Confessionalism and confessionalization are two terms that, were, that had been around in use, but in the late 1970s, for those who are not aware, two German historians by the name of Hans Schilling and Wolfgang Reinhardt, uh, took the idea of confessionalization and made it into a master narrative of European history explaining the rise of the Reformation and the Counter-Reformation. And they focused on the use of such things as social discipline and state formation and creating distinct blocks of confessional identities known as, of course, Protestants, Catholics, and so on. For the longest time, until about 2010 or so, the confessionalization thesis was exclusively and uh, extensively applied to Europe. In the, in the last 10 years, uh, a number of scholars, including, uh, of course, University of Michigan's own Tiana Kristic, uh, Derin Terzioglu of uh, Boazici, as well as in other circles, um, I knew I was gonna forget his name, but there's a world historian who is someone I know actually, but his name has been blocked at the moment, have used confessionalism as a global category. They basically, they used the confessionalization discourse and made it subject to the rise of global history. And they've argued that far from being exclusively confined to Central Europe, it's a process that is very much presence, present also in the Eastern Mediterranean, particularly in the Ottoman Empire and to some extent also in Safavid, Iran. And so where does this uh, take us as far as Armenian scholarship is concerned, you might be asking, and the answer to that is in short, in the form of a little self-promotion perhaps. Uh, in Armenian circles, confessionalization as a unit of analysis has been only recently broached, uh, and the people who are responsible for this, I will name the others first, uh, Anna Ohanjanyan from Yerevan, who's a graduate from Budapest, studied with, I think she's a graduate from Budapest, but she's, she was, uh, she's, she's been active at, at the Central European University under Tiana's guidance, as well as a friend and colleague of mine, Cesare Santos from Rome. And last, least, uh, last but perhaps not least, uh, I myself have also used the idea of confessionalization to make sense of the rise of interconfessional strife within the Armenian community. And, and my argument specifically is that confessionalism in the Armenian world enters sometime in the 1640s. In Europe, it's around 1550, 1530. Different people have different approaches. But in Europe, they end the age of confessionalization in the 16, 1640s. So it's only a very short period, about 100 years. In the Armenian context, confessionalization begins in the 1640s with the arrival of Jesuit and other missionaries from the Propaganda Fide in Rome uh, after its foundation in 1622, and then they begin proselytizing in the East, and as a result, of course, not surprisingly, they cause a backlash in the form of the Armenian church uh, defining itself strictly as an apostolic and miaphysite church and combating Catholicism in any form. And so in the Armenian context, uh, it becomes an engine of book history, 
precisely because around the same time as the printing press is being used to uh, uh, disseminate Armenian memory in the form of print, uh, the, Ar the Armenian church as well as Catholic Armenians resort to the printing press to advance their confessional agendas. And this leads to, um, this leads to the, uh, the question of how is it that I know that confessionalism actually exists in Armenian printing. And to this I can say in a few words that I actually did not, I was not aware of confessionalism as an important category or concept of analysis, uh, concept of, uh, to be studied in history until I began writing my chapter nine of my book, quite late in the book. And I thought to myself, having read the work of Raymond Kevorkian, one of the few Armenian historians who is influenced by the Annal School, and in fact, his advisor was none other than the great Henri Jean Martin. So Raymond's book does a preliminary approach of an, an application of Annal uh, methodology to this, and he, has, he does some quantification, which is one of the hardcore uh, uh, one of the important contributions of the Annal, even though it has been discredited since the 1990s, unfortunately, but I think it should make a comeback in some form, and I'm hoping to do that in this book for the Armenian case. So Raymond basically looks at uh, uh, book production from 1512 to 1695, and he reduces the books following the work of Francois Furet, who wrote a, a transformative essay in 1965, uh, statistically quantifying 31,000 books that were produced in France with a French license and cl classifies them in different categories. And what he does is he does religion. He looks at uh, religious books in the form of Bibles, New Testaments, and so on. Then he has liturgical manuals, then other, litur 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 uh, uh, then other forms of religious literature. So, uh, he concludes that in 1695, 72% of all the books produced out of 212 books were religious in nature. So I had taken this uh, idea and I thought, let me do my own quantification and see how far low, how far, how rock bottom this curve is going to go in the 18th century because my assumption was, was Armenians lived in India and Madras, Calcutta. They were secular, quote unquote, they, were, they had the same reading tastes as the Europeans did with whom they lived because the letters I had seen indicated this was the trend. And when I began to count, I was actually shocked and somewhat almost like the 2016 elections, uh, shocked and surprised at the fact that the curve of confessionalization kept on climbing and climbing. It wouldn't stop from 72% to 91% in 1711 and 12, 17, 1700 to 1710, and then it kept on going, and then until the 1780s, when you first begin to notice a slight decline in religious books under the category of liturgical and confessional manuals, basically. So uh, these are graphs that uh, have been constructed for me by my very talented graduate student, uh, Daniel Ohanian, who has been working with me in producing these uh, tables in the French style of counting 820 books titles and classifying them according to their genre and where they belong. And the results we got were actually quite astonishing. As I mentioned, we have the period at the peak of Armenian interconfessional strife from 1700 to 1710. You have 90% of the book output produced in Armenian uh, in the form of confessional manuals, confessional books, literally religious books. And as you can see, it doesn't really die down until the 1790s, maybe. Uh, 1780s, there are periods when it experiences a peak because of interconfessional strife. The Armenian case of confessionalism, unlike Europe, lasts uh, until probably the early 19th century. It's not, it, it's not over like, as it is in Europe, where you have desacralization in France and religious books plummeting into 10% of the output. output. The opposite is the case with the Armenians. So uh, here are some interesting insights gathered through the uh, approach, the anal approach of quantification or serial history. Uh, again, I owe these tables to Daniel and his uh, long time of laboring over these stats. So we can see here on the left side, in terms of language, 
uh, the language of confessionalization or the language of print, we can see that a whopping 90% of the books produced by Armenians in the early modern period fell, falls under the category, category of classical Armenian. Uh, so this is a highly religious, that's also indexed for religiosity and confessionalism to a large extent. 4% of the books is an Armeno Turkish, which I would argue is the vernacular language of the Armenians in the 18th century. Armeno Turkish is the Armenian vernacular. Uh, and then, of course, we have uh, civil Armenian books, books written in Kalkat Siagan Ayren, a form, a precursor to Ashkarapa, only 1%. So I won't belabor that point because I'm running out of time, but also you can see here the ups and downs of the, I'd like to say curve. In, in the French tradition, they say a curve, but in this case, they're actually jagged uh, lines. Uh, so ups and downs of publishing on the basis of location of print city, uh, location of cities, right? Port cities. Istanbul is by far, hands down, the dominant place of book production, followed uh, very closely by Venice and then other locations. Okay, so I will quickly jump to summarizing the meat of my argument because I've abused my stay uh, and talk about the, uh, about the printing revolution. In short, to summarize all this in a few words, I would say that the printing revolution represents a methodical transfer of the treasures and wealth that was produced over a thousand years through scribal production to the new technology, basically like a computer transfer where all the knowledge was transferred to this new medium that was cheaper, standardized, no errors or very few errors, portable, very important in the age of mobility, uh, and durable, known as the printed codex. Uh, where, well, what form did this revolution take place? The revolution essentially took, uh, took shape in two, two stages. First stage, I would argue, and this is the original part of my contribution, uh, confessional works were transferred from manuscripts to print. This began in 1643 and ended in 1733 with the publication of Makhitar's Bible, all religious texts that the church needed for its own services and to fight against uh, Catholic encroachment were transferred methodically from manuscripts to print. Once this was done, the, the next stage of the revolution was to focus on historical manuals, classical manuals that, like religious manuals, were extremely low in number because of constant warfare on the Armenian plateau and the, the frontier region between the Savids and the Ottomans. In this stage, you, had, you have the printing of Morses Khorinati in 1695, up until 1793 when you have Ghazar Parpeti printed in Venice. In between, you have, of course, the translation of Yeri uh, Shevar Tabed, you have major other historians, all of them methodically transferred to print. And once they're transferred, the manuscript is essentially thrown away. It, it, is becomes, it becomes only of use for scholars who are interested in producing critical editions in the 19th century and onwards. But for, uh, for the purposes of transmitting memory, the manuscript ceases its place, it, use, it is usurped by mechanical reproduction, which drives the manuscript out of the market by the middle of the 18th century and takes on all of its prerogatives as the transmitter of religious and national memory. So uh, Madras and London, well, Madras and St. Petersburg. The Russian press has not been examined in any way, even in the Armenian language literature. Very, very little attention has been devoted to it, but essentially, the press in St. Petersburg is, is established in seven, in seven, around 1782 or 83, after its re, uh, relocation from London, where an Armenian merchant from India had established a printing press. From St. Petersburg, it moves down to Nornakhichevan, a new colony established by this gentleman here, Ergaina Pazukhov Sep Yebiskobos, Arkebiskobos, the primate of the, all the Armenians in the Russian Empire, known as the Long Armed One whose arms reached across to India, to Afghanistan, to all sorts of places in terms of micromanaging affairs of the diaspora. Uh, his descendants were known as Longomano in, Ita in Italy. And the founder of the press in London is Gregor Khojamar. So now, with a few concluding remarks, remarks on printing in Madras, 1772, the first printing press is established in Madras. Uh, 
It is set up in the house of a very wealthy merchant tycoon by the name of Shahamir Shamirian, and prints its first book, authored in part by his son, Hagop Shahamirian, a very tragic figure. And, a, and the book is called Nor Tetrak Forgochi Hortorag, which is interestingly uh, subtitled, uh, composed for the awakening of the Armenian youth from the week of apathetic drowsiness and of the sleep of slothfulness. Quite a mouthful. But as we mentioned, uh, uh, Benedict Anderson earlier on, as we know from his uh, brief chapter on history and so on, the idea of awakening nations, the sleeping beauty of uh, nationalism, as Ron uses the term in one of his essays, actually is already present here in 1772. You might think it's pre, it's anachronistic of me to project it backwards, but it's actually, I would make an argument that there is an argument to be made for the modernity of this approach. And what's interesting about this book is that chapter five, presents the first global, the first history of the Armenian nation ever written in the modern period, predating Chamchian by 15 years at least. And in this history, when you pick it up and read it, you realize very quickly that the authors have not used a single manuscript. They have been relying exclusively on printed editions, first editions. Khorenazi is the most important source in some ways, 1695, 1753, two editions in the early modern period, used extensively here and not the, not the manuscript, because manuscripts did not exist and were cumbersome to carry on and so forth. They use Mechitar's uh, Parkir Kai Gazian Lezvi, the second volume. They used Ghazar Jaketzi's History of the Armenians in a religious form, written in a book called Dracht Tsangali. So I use this as a case study of the printing revolution at work. And I conclude the book by looking at confessionalism in Russia with Argutians and the secular quote unquote wing in, in South Asia with Shahmirians who are alluding to Montesquieu, to Locke, but never mentioning them, but certainly cribbing their ideas from the European Enlightenment. At the end of the discussion, it is clear that Argutians and company have essentially won the first round of this conflict because of the importance of confessionalism in the Armenian context that lasts way beyond the 18th century when it is almost over everywhere else except in the Armenian church because of confessional uh, the, the, the disputes and distinctions and because of Catholicism in the form of the Mechitaris and others. So I will end here and hopefully it, uh, I got, got across a few ideas. Thank you. All right, good afternoon, I guess, or maybe close to evening now. <laughs> um, I would like to start by thanking Melanie and Catherine for inviting me to join this wonderful workshop. And also, I would like to take the occasion, I never did this before, to thank Kevork and Jiraj, who are mostly responsible in a positive sense of this world for my coming to Michigan because <laughs> I used to meet with both of them in 2007 in Armenia and six, uh, well, we on various occasions, and that's when I, they actually uh, played an instrumental role in convincing me to apply to the PhD program here. And I did eventually, and I did my PhD here. And I, I, I was one of the few fortunates who, so who actually worked with all the former chairs here. So with Ron, with Kevork, with um, Jirai, with Catherine. And I, I, my writing and thinking has been influenced by all of your work and you know, by working with you for so many years. It's been more than 10 years, I should say now. Okay, so um, I came from sociology background, so that's still present in me. That's one of my identities. And, but I've worked mostly with historians here, so that's another part of my identities. And my writing also has been influenced by both of these worlds, so I call myself historical sociologist, but, but mo most often I call myself diaspora scholar because I used to write and do my research about the Armenian diaspora, and I had ended up writing about the historical events that actually contributed to the forming of modern Armenian diaspora, post-genocide Armenian diaspora. So, well, today I'm going to present um, part which is 
going to become eventually one part of my book. I'm not clear yet which part, but it has some theoretical um, uh, base that I'm trying to develop in order to uh, kind of provide a more substantial background to the lot of abundant history that I used to have in my dissertation to frame it more into more um, theoretical and comparative perspectives. I mean, the formation of diaspora, and the process of the formation of diasporas. So in this talk, I'm going to actually make an attempt to uh, connect diasporization, the process of diasporization and cultural objects and how these objects signify the presence of diasporas and also make an argument about the permanence of diasporas, which is often um, counter to the perceived notion of diasporas being temporary, diasporas being between, in between two cultures or multiple um, host lands, ho homelands. So, uh, all right, so let me start my talk and hopefully, and yeah, uh, so more, most of the ideas here are, you know, um, experimental, I should say, and your comments and feedback will be very much appreciated and will help me to move forward with, with my project. Okay, so um, when crossing, uh, did it? All right. When crossing the narrow bridge connecting the city of Beirut in Lebanon to the northeastern suburb of Buch Hamoud, one of an observant eye will notice some distinctive objects that stand out in the skyline. Hidden amongst taller buildings, several churches demonstrate their cone-shaped domes with crosses on the top. If that happens to be in May. One may even also notice a flag in the skyline in wavering on one of the taller buildings with three colors that do not resemble the Lebanese national flag with the green cedar tree in the middle. These, three uh, these tricolor flags become almost omnipresent in the streets of Burchamut in May when the local community celebrates a major holiday, which is the independence of the First Republic of Armenia. These flags, churches, uh, some street signs and inscriptions on various buildings written in Armenian make these neighborhoods visually distinctive and different from the surrounding areas in Beirut. All these cultural objects may bear different meanings to and invoke different emotions among tourists, visitors, the Lebanese and non-Lebanese in Burchamut. Some foreign visitors may recognize the tricolor flag as the national flag of the Republic of Armenia. To these visitors, this flag, flag may symbolize the presence of, Arme of an Armenian diplomatic mission in that particular building. To the local Lebanese, the flags and other cultural objects symbolize the Armenian neighborhood. They, they, they know. Cultural objects, such as national flags, uh, ethnic names, signs, posts, alphabets, architectural constructs, and other signifying similar spaces can be found in many other countries as well. I define cultural object as any object that contains distinctive features and meanings which make that object identifiable with an ethnic cultural collectivity and different from other similar objects. Chinatowns, Little Italy's, Greek towns, Jewish, Armenian, or African neighborhoods are some examples of spaces that exist in many countries and that are often marked by cultural objects, whether public or private, visible or invisible, making them identifiable with Chinese, Italian, Greek, Jewish, Armenian, or African cultures. Scholars of material culture convincingly argue that objects can uh, signify things and establish social meanings. Objects can create people as much as people create objects. They can help people develop group attachments, can influence the formation of self-identity and esteem, and can also integrate and differentiate social groups, classes, and collectivities. Cultural objects, likewise, can have the ability to shape diasporic boundaries by uh, various symbolic meanings they acquire among the dispersed populations, their descendants, and in local societies. Yet diaspora and materiality have rarely become subjects of scholarly investigation. The interdisciplinary field of diaspora studies has been preoccupied with defining and theorizing the term diaspora as well as exploring diasporic complexities and hybrid identities, examining problems of immigration, transnationalism, diaspora politics, and politics. If diasporas are often defined as parad paradigmatic others of nation states, and if they are theorized in their inherent dialectical tension between homelands and hostlands, how do these diasporic cultural objects emerge and continue 
without being in tension with the dominant societal culture in various countries? How are these cultural objects that by definition belong to a different culture still being tolerated in various countries even if at times even at times when discrimination against the cultural collectivity claiming the, claiming the ownership of those objects continues. In my brief presentation, I primarily focus on cultural objects and diasporic spaces that signifies as an already uh, accomplished fact, leaving out the details of how these spaces develop historically in various countries. I actually do that in my book project. This brief presentation is part of my book in progress in which I examine the emergence of diasporic spaces in various countries throughout the 20th century from historical, theoretical, and comparative perspectives. My goal in this paper is to discuss some examples of cultural objects that signify diasporic spaces and argue that beyond their signifying characteristics, these cultural objects also symbolize the relative permanence of diasporas and also the diversity of local societies. I'm going to start by briefly outlining the major theoretical approaches in diaspora studies. Then I will introduce my um, conceptualization as, of diasporas as being rooted in spaces of difference. And then I will further suggest three types of these spaces and um, will discuss the cultural objects associated with these spaces that symbolize diasporic presence and permanence. Diaspora studies is a relatively young field of scholarly inquiry. Proliferating, especially since the 1990s, the field has become quite diverse and dispersed as scholars of various disciplinary backgrounds began contributing to diaspora theorization. In my observation, three major approaches currently dominate the interdisciplinary field of diaspora studies. I call the first approach ethnic resiliency, that reflects the tendency amongst GAM scholars to emphasize the resilience of ethnic forms in the triadic relations between diasporas, their homelands, and host countries. To distinguish diasporas from other similar formations, such as ethnic minorities, these scholars suggest some ideal typical characteristics of diasporas. Among those, orientation and return to homeland are often discussed as one of the key elements of diasporas. Diasporic boundaries in this approach are provided and maintained through ethnically defined cultural markers and are any crossing of ethnic boundaries, whether through intermarriage or otherwise, are considered assimilation. This particular way of thinking has been criticized for essentializing the shared ethnic traits among the dispersed populations. The second approach that I call hybrid laterality encompasses the contrasting viewpoint emerging under the influence of post-colonial scholarship. This approach challenges the structuralism of ethnic resiliency approach as being less appropriate for examining diasporas beyond nation state frameworks, frameworks and ethnically absolutist perspectives. These scholars examine instead lateral connections, boundary crossing, cultural interactions, the mixing of diasporic cultural forms and identities as ongoing processes within diasporas. The third approach that I call transmigrant diasporicity expresses the tendency among some scholars to associate diasporas with transmigrant communities operating in transnational social fields. This approach uh, evolved as scholars in migration studies, diaspora policies, and politics began addressing global migration and population movements beyond the assimilation integration frameworks. These scholars examine transnational social spaces and cross-border communication among transmigrant communities and their respective countries of origin and residence. Defined as immigrants who are involved and engaged in multiple transborder communications and social relations, who are embedded in more than one nation state, transmigrants and their communities indeed resemble diasporas in many ways. The intense connections of dispersed transmigrant communities with their homelands have determined the tendency among scholars to define these communities of recent immigrants and descendants and their descendants as diasporas. Proponents of this approach often make little distinction between the interrelated concepts of expatriate communities, diasporas, and transmigrants. The term diaspora is usually defined broadly enough to include all these other forms of dispersed transnational communities. What I found lacking in the approaches I briefly outlined here were theoretical approaches that would explain diaspora formation from an historical perspective. I shared the presumption with Hachik Toroli and Robin Cohn and other scholars 
that not all dispersed people and communities um, develop diasporas. In my view, diaspora implies the multi-generational presence of a culturally distinct collectivity of people in multiple locations other than what they perceive to be their collective ancestral land of origin, who stay connected through various transnational networks. The land of origin can be real or imagined, a nation state, a historical or geographical region such as land of Israel, historic Armenia, Caribbean, or even a continent or subcontinent such as Africa or South Asia. Following this definition, my major research question is how do diasporas evolve and how do diasporic people, communities, institutions, and cultural production continue for decades and centuries in places and countries outside what they collectively perceive to be their ancestral homeland. The broader argument that I'm suggesting in my book, In Progress, is that diasporas develop in transnationally connected spaces of difference. There is some literature on spaces of difference, and I'm trying to incorporate that into my writing, but I'm going to skip the literature review to, to just provide my definition of that and then um, uh, talk about the types of spaces that I'm um, exploring here. By spaces of difference, I refer to any culturally distinct spaces in the United States, France, Russia, Turkey, or elsewhere that can be called Armenian, Jewish, African, Greek, Cuban, Mexican, or other that are not part of any foreign diplomatic missions. Dispersed populations may produce a diaspora when they succeed to establish various cultural spaces of difference in their new places of residence. I'm sorry, I skipped that slide. Um, yes. Uh, when these um, unique spaces become embedded in the social fabric of their, so uh, so, um, of their local societies and when they remain transnationally connected through an exchange of people, discourses, material, and non-material resources. It is within these spaces of difference that members of disparate populations and their descendants can articulate, experience, exercise, and thereby preserve what they believe to be their distinctive ethnic cultural traits and what differentiates them from local other populations and society at large. Um, even the most assimilatory polities such as the United States or France in the early decades of the 20th century provided spaces in which the immigrants and the, their descendants could articulate, exercise, and experience their differences and integrate into local societies without complete assimilation. The fundamental principles of freedom of speech, assembly of, and expression, as well as the separation of church and, the, and state in the United States, for example, yielded spaces in which the immigrants and their descendants could negotiate alternative routes, routes to full integration without melting into an American pot. Same was true for France and many other European countries. Jews, Armenians, and other immigrants in France and the United States could freely establish synagogues and churches, societies and publishing houses, even, they of, even if they often felt discriminated in those societies in the early decades of the 20th century. Um, Jewish immigrants constructed synagogues, Armenians built churches, marking those sites and neighborhoods as Jewish or Armenian. For example, this church that emerged in 1891 in Worcester. Immigrants creating, um, coming from the same town, region, or country tended to regroup in the new country, creating compact ethnic neighborhoods often marked by some cultural objects, like churches. Not all cultural spaces of difference emerging in various countries necessarily become part of diasporas. Um, not all Irish, Italian, Greek, or Chinese spaces in America are necessarily part of the Irish, Italian, Greek, or Chinese diasporas. But I call these spaces potentially diasporic because they can be potentially incorporated into a diaspora. So diasporas emerge when these spaces of difference um, in various countries become transnationally connected through personal, organizational, or institutional networks, which make the exchange of discourses, cultural products, and material and non-material resources possible among similar spaces elsewhere, and often with the country associated with the ancestral homeland. These exchanges usually happen within a single ethnoscape, to use Arjun Abadurai's terminology, but diasporic spaces, however, are not necessarily ethnic spaces, as diaspora populations often develop trans-ethnic and mixed affiliations and identities. I suggest three types of cultural spaces of difference that diasporas usually are rooted in. These are the institutional, discursive, and communal spaces. This is not an exhaustive list, of course, but rather some of the most common spaces of difference emerging in various countries. 
the institutional spaces emerge around an institutional organization, whether um, religious, educational, youth, women, charitable, or other. Discursive spaces emerge, around, emerge among the subscribers and readers of periodicals, audiences of various TV and radio programs that have the potential to make connections between people and communities transnationally. Technological advancements, internet, and social media provide significantly more opportunities for expansion of discursive and virtual spaces in the contemporary world. But in my theorization of diaspora formation, I'm mostly interested in discursive spaces emerging around various periodicals and publications. And finally, by communal spaces, I mean the spaces that emerge within densely populated ethnic localities. Places of worship are arguably the most common type of objects uh, signifying institutional spaces of difference in various countries. The architecture of various places of worship, such as synagogues, churches, or mosques, usually embodies the unique cultural objects that make them visually distinctive and identifiable with a certain culture. Greek or Russian Orthodox churches, Jewish synagogues, Armenian Apostolic churches in various countries symbolize not only the presence of a religious institution, but also the cultural space that is identifiable with the Greek, Russian, Jewish, or Armenian cultures. The magnificent architecture and design of these buildings implies that people who raised funds brought together a group of architects, planners, benefactors, and community who invested much time and resources in accomplishing the, pro uh, the project did not think of being temporary in the place where they had initiated the construction project. Um, the orange-colored buildings of St. Leon Armenian Cathedral and Western Diocese of the Armenian Church in California, for instance, are made of the Armenian stone called Duf. The stones of this church and the diocese building occupying large space in Burbank, California, were all imported from Armenia, making the construction much more expensive. The intent behind the construction was not to have a temporary place, but a permanent institution serving the growing local Armenian population. These kinds of buildings make the Armenians visible and identifiable cult cultural collectivity, whether in California or elsewhere. At the same time, they also serve as tangible symbols of the ethnic diversity in the area. The assumption that diasporas are neither here nor there, that they are temporary in their host countries, fades against the presence of these permanent structures, cultural objects, and the vibrant institutional spaces of difference they embody. Discursive spaces are less conspicuous compared to the objects signifying institutional spaces. These are deterritorialized spaces connecting large numbers of populations outside their immediate neighborhoods and communal spaces. Periodicals and newspapers are some examples of cultural objects that shape and signify discursive spaces. Radio and TV programs and now social media are other examples that provide opportunities for the proliferation of transnational discursive spaces. Well, it has been argued already and by Benedict Anderson and Seb also showed how newspapers and printing actually have a formative role in constructing identities and belongings even if people do not know each other personally, right? So publications and periodicals and newspapers established by the immigrant populations in many countries likewise connect their dispersed members in a discursive space shaping their identities, aspirations, political and social views. The Armenian language Haydnik, here are some examples, established in Boston in 1899 has provided a discurs discursive space among its Armenian readers for more than a century. Similarly, the Jewish, um, the Four Verts, established in 1897 in the Lower East Side, is still being published in English and Yiddish, providing an alternative discursive space to its Jewish American readership, among other Jewish newspapers. I should note here but that the, the sometimes parallel discursive spaces emerge within a single ethnoscape, like Armenians or Jewish, not even being in interaction with each other, which connect different sectors of the um, community. Both the Hydenic and the Forwards they started in America in, Yid, in Armenian and Yiddish accordingly, but both began publishing in English as well as the descendants of their respective readership grew more Anglophone. Yet the cultural objects, the newspapers, the Hydenic or the Forwards, whether published in Armenian, Yiddish or English, have symbolized the Armenian and the Jewish discursive spaces respectfully for more than a century. Their relative longevity symbolizes their relative permanence in the American society. <clears throat> 
Institutional and discursive spaces are often embedded within larger communal space. Cultural objects signifying the presence of a communal space may range from flags and street signs to the presence of a number of buildings embodying various cultural elements. Returning to the example I discussed in the beginning, the presence of an Armenian communal space in Burj Hamoud is significant not only as signified not only with Armenian churches and tricolor flags, but also with street signs. Armenian language writings on signs. Okay, let me show you this right here. Armenian language writings on signs on various buildings and other Armenian artistic forms, such as graffiti, painting, business names, and wall murals. Similar objects mark the presence of our Armenian communal spaces in France, um, the United States, and elsewhere. These spaces can often be marked by objects with explicit cultural references, such as the signs of Little Italy, Little Armenia, Chinatown, or other. Other times, they may not be as explicit, such as the Jewish communal spaces enclosed within an air of boundaries. Um, well, I want to make a point before finishing about the mixing of these cultural spaces because they, well, the two points before I finish. So first point is these spaces usually become part of this society. So this is, this is the church in Marseille and this is a plaque describing the church. And if you pay attention, the plaque is titled Histoire de Marseille. So it presents the, uh, the relations of Marseille with Armenians and then thereby makes this church part of the history of Marseille. It's no longer, it's, it's not alien to Marseille. It's part of the history of Marseille and local history. So these uh, cultural objects become embedded in the local societies. Um, again, that's um, for the permanence of diasporic spaces. And the second point that I want to make, this um, these spaces are not ethnically ex exclusive. They sometimes are mixed space spaces. And one of the most tangible ex examples of this mixing is probably the liturgy books found in many churches across the United States, in which you have this middle section, which is really the mix of Armenian and English. And if you pay closer attention, it's not just Armenian. It's Western Armenian American English transliteration, this midsection, because you see for example, I, I have the word Badras Tutsun, and they transliterate it according to Western Armenian and English pronunciation standards. It's no, no, nothing other than that. So uh, again, pointing to this mixing and diversity and hybridity of diasporic forms. So um, I'd like to end with more, one more example from Burchamut, and this is summarizing my point. On October 13, 2007, the Mesrobian Armenian Catholic High School in Burchamut, Lebanon, opened a monument on its playground dedicated to Mesrob Mashtots, the monk who invented the Armenian alphabet in the fifth century. On this occasion, the school principal stated, the erection of this monument dedicated to Mashtots in the Mesrobian school symbolizes our clinging to Lebanon, both as the homeland of the Lebanese and as the mother colony of the Armenian diaspora. The monument, thus, the cultural object, symbolizes the clinging the permanence of the Armenian institutional space in Lebanon and also implies the belonging of this Armenian space to Lebanon and the Armenian diaspora at the same time. Thank you. Thank you for these presentations and uh, thank you again, Melanie, for the invitation to present here. And as Melanie mentioned, I am trained as an anthropologist. I I'm a medical anthropologist and at the same time an anthropologist of religion. So uh, my work, part of my work touches on questions of materiality, but in terms of kind of Armenian studies, I am a transgressor and I am a recidivist because this is the second time that I have the occasion of um, um, uh, participating in an Armenian studies conference. So I'm very glad to be back here. Um, I know we have limited time and probably will go a bit um, over time, but I do hope uh, that we'll have time for at least a few questions. And um, I'm, I want to present a few kind of uh, thoughts and to raise some questions about each paper individually, particularly in uh, what concerns um, the question of materiality. Uh, but uh, also before I do that, I want to spend a few minutes reflecting on the way in which these three presentations intersect, complement each other, and the, ma manner in, the manner in which they speak in different ways to the question of materiality that is at the center of the panel. 
the three authors tackle Armenian materiality from different disciplinary perspectives. Chris from that of anthropology mainly, Sabu of history, and Vahe of diaspora studies, and as I learn now, of sociology also. Uh, but these are just kind of broad lenses. They neither grasp nor exhaust the richness of their approaches and insights. Thus, like all good scholars, they bring into discussion a variety of theoretical orientations and conceptual tools, like the ontological turn, semiotics, the historiographic tradition of the history of the book, studies of nationalism and of trans transnationalism. Beyond the conceptual toolkit brought to bear on Armenian materiality, what specific aspects of materiality are selected for analysis also differ among the three panelists. Chris is interested in the materiality of Jesus Christ himself, if one can put it this way, and more generally in the conceptions of materiality at the center, center of Armenian theo theology, theology, in particular the doctrine of incarnation. For Cebu, the materiality he traces is that of books, of printing presses, and of epistles, while for Vahe, it is that of what he calls cultural objects, flags, signs, buildings, alphabets, as well as newspapers. In short, the materiality at stake in these three contributions is not the same. Each of the three papers also tackles not only different kinds of materiality, but also diverse ways of placing these materialities within wider context, be they analytical or empirical. Chris positions the discussion at the most meta level of the three papers. He is concerned with the connections between Armenian theology, studies of materiality, especially the so-called ontological turn, and semiotics. Here, the wider context of materiality is in a way theory, anthropological and otherwise. Unlike Chris, Sebu and Vahe trace the, work, trace the work of objects in various historical formations and processes, such as the emergence of a sense of national belonging and of historical memory in the Armenian di diaspora during the early mo modern period, or objects work as signifiers of diaspor diasporic presence and diasporic spaces of difference in the 19th and 20th centuries. So we have theoretical approaches, types of materiality, and connections with broader processes and context. These are the three aspects that simultaneously bring together and draw apart the presentations we heard this afternoon. In that sense, they are perfect companions to each other because each individual paper illuminates and contributes to some strands of the multifaceted material turn from the past decades. In fact, a lingering thought I had after reading the papers is how well they demonstrate that the question and concept of materiality is not one, but many. Then perhaps we can think whether it is not more appropriate to talk not of materiality in singular, but of materialities in plural, to talk of different kinds of materialities and of the diverse types of contribution they could make to Armenian studies. Let me move now to offer a, a few brief remark, remarks on each individual paper. As mentioned above, Chris, okay. Chris' paper takes us simultaneously into two equally fascinating worlds, that of Armenian theology on one hand and that of contemporary academic debates on the other. We learn thus about Armenian Christology the theological reflection over the, over the embodied nature and material nature of Christ, as Chris puts it. At the same time, the paper provides a succinct introduction into contemporary concerns with materiality, especially through the prism of the ontological turn and interdisciplinary analysis of semiotics. But what is distinctive in my view about Chris' paper is not the simple fact of bringing these two domains together. In the end, this is what academics do. They use theoretical approaches to analyze a particular historical and contemporary formation. What is distinctive here is how, is the how, the manner in which the two are brought together, or more accurately, the different manners he thinks the two together. First, Chris notes that the material turn in social sciences and humanities has sort of spilled out outside academic confines and has been embraced by theologians themselves, as evidenced, for example, by, the, by conferences like Byzantine materiality. 
Of course, this should not come as a surprise since theologians are intellectuals in their own right, so not necessarily treated as equals interlocutors by the academic community. Second, Chris underlines how the doctrine of incarnation is, and I quote, implicated and imbricated in debates about materiality. Armenian theological doctrine also provides a distinct conception of science and signification that resonates with recent concerns in linguistic anthropology that take inspiration from the work of Pierce to connect materiality and semiotics through the materiality of science. Thus, it is not only that religious people are taking as partners in academic debate, but theology itself, with its own conceptualization of science, matter, or representation, join, join the social scientific toolkit in his Chris formulation and can intervene in contemporary theoretical debates. Here, the gap and distinction between a theoretical approach and an object of investigation is narrowed, almost erased, and theolo theology is posited as an intellectual interlocutor. These insights brought to my mind related debates about the relationship between the analysis of religious people and those of scholars, as discussed in various disciplines. In religious studies, for example, such questions fall under the heading of the insider-outsider problem which constitutes a reflection on the differences between the academic study of religion and believers' take on their own practices and religious traditions. Similarly, some anthropologists of religion have called recently for an ethnography of God, for taking God seriously as a social actor, while at the same time maintaining a distance between the ontological stance of theology and that of social science. If my reading of Chris's paper above is right, then he takes these concerns from religious studies and anthropology one step further. And I, th I think his intervention would be enriched if we were to address such debates. Sebu initially shared with me a longer version uh, of the paper on which the presentation is based, which is one chapter of his forthcoming book. And while the first, the task of reading 60 pages, I think, uh, was kind of daunting. I started and then I couldn't stop. So um, um, I am glad that this presentation today gave you a kind of a foretaste of the book and uh, I, I'm sure it will be great and you should all um, check it out when it's available. So my comments will be mainly based on uh, that particular chapter that uh, was part of the presentation, especially the last part of the presentation. The chapter, uh, takes readers into the enthralling world of religious figures, printers, publishers, and patrons in the Armenian diaspora of the 18th century, a world of trans-imperial and transnational mobility, of declining commerce, but also of emergent historical memory, nationalist discourse, and a budding national consciousness. He convincingly, convincingly demonstrates how print serve, as he puts it, and I quote, a handmaiden of historical memory and indirectly to the birthing of nation, birthing, birthing of, na of the nation. The chapter evolves around this strong connection, the intimate relationship between print culture and the nation form, and contributes hence to discussions of nationalism um, that um, in the tradition of Anderson and others earlier on. The printed book is the material object, the matter around which the chapter spins. And as Sabu emphasizing in the coda, and in his presentation today, his approach is meant to, and I quote again, bring out a vast and concealed apparatus that lies behind, underneath, and beyond all the books, as well as bring out the work of the myriad characters and infrastructures that have made diasporic Armenian print culture possible, end quote. This is done masterfully, yet the way I read it, the chapter seems to me to foreground the manifold people behind the materi materiality of the object. At least in the piece uh, circulated, the materiality of the book is le less that of ink, print, press, paper, the actual materiality, the matter, uh, even though these aspe aspects are certainly present, but it's more the, of the people that have made the print culture possible. I do not mean this as a critique, especially in light of my argument above that we should think about different kinds of materialities, but it does raise a, for me a question that comes from a particular strand in the recent uh, material turn. Uh, and this is what is so-called the agency of non-human entities. 
mosquitoes, trees, the wind, and books in this particular. And I was just thinking while reading as a kind of mental exercise how this approach, which initially emerges from the action nectar theory and is meant to study scientific processes, and which certainly is not without its problem and its detractors, how would the kind of universe that uh, you are trying to bring to life will look if will actually be narrated from the perspective of uh, the non-human agent at stake here, the book in particular. Um, and now to the final paper of the pa panel that also deals with uh, the Armenian diaspora, this time closer to our present. The paper itself includes many wonderful photographs, and I especially appreciate how many more photographs you uh, brought here. And I thought that this, they kind of ground and give substance, matter actually, to a discussion about materiality, because at the end, photographs are also objects. Um, Vahe's paper begins by usefully reviewing major approaches in diaspora study, moving afterward to introduce his own conceptualization of diaspora. His perspective highlights the centrality of what he calls spaces of difference in the formation of diaspora and the particular role of culture objects there. And uh, you provided a very nice kind of uh, um, um, introduction to your own approach, so I'm not going to go uh, through that also in interest of uh, time. Um, Throughout the discussion, Vahe emphasizes how the cultural objects that animate the diasporic spaces of difference work as signifiers of diasporic presence and permanence. In fact, the words most often associated in the paper with these cultural objects are signify and symbolize. This symbolic role of object is certainly important. Yet I wonder if cultural objects, including the cultural objects uh, Vahe talks about, do more than that. And do here, I think, is the key word. Objects do things in the world. World, They have social life. They create, not only symbolize, but actually make a diasporic community. And uh, this kind of observation also comes from another strand in uh, the recent uh, material turn, which is precisely this kind of attempt to shift uh, the focus, on, the focus from meaning and interpretation toward an increased attention to the object's materiality, to practices around objects that generate specific kind of realities, to how objects are enacted and their social lives. Uh, and uh, I just, I would be, this is kind of an open question. I would be curious to hear your thoughts on that. Thank you. And because I'm also the chair, uh, <laughs> and I don't think that we have much time, perhaps it would be more interesting for everybody if we could take a few questions, uh, maybe three questions, and then. Yes. Uh, thank you, all speakers. Uh, my question is to um, Sebu. This is a lovely book project. It's very exciting. I'm looking forward to reading it. Uh, I'll first ask the question and then try to make a minor contribution. The question is, why did you stop at 1800? Because, uh, I mean, uh, I'm working on 19th century texts mainly. And from what I can see, the same thing continues throughout the 19th century, and in mid-19th century, in the novels I read, it's all about interconfessional like uh, fights, and that that's the central theme in those texts. Uh, I have uh, two sources which could be of use. Uh, one of them is a dissertation, unpublished dissertation. So. Uh, one of my colleagues uh, just made charts of Hasmik Stepanyan's bibliography, and exactly 33% of the books in her bibliography are religious books, and most of them are, um, like, I think, especially the Armenian church began publishing Armenian Turkish books after the rise of Catholic and Protestant book production. So there are numbers there. And there is another scholar in Ankara, 
uh, I think he uh, documented the American board publications in Armenia Turkish, and you can get the numbers there. So mm -hmm. that's sure. the good. Thank you so much. Thank you. Perhaps we can take two more questions, Kenborg and Catherine. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> this is for Khachatur. For I mean for Christopher, right? Yes. Um, you spoke of the um, Alexandrian uh, uh, theology, and of course, uh, the guy Cyril. Um, there are many theologians who think that he confused between thesis and hypostasis, the nature and person, uh, in his theology, in his Christology. And if so, first question is, is this still held up? That he was really, he really confused between these two? If so, how would you deal with this? How would this fit into your materiality uh, interpretation. If he, if if thesis, if he thought hypostasis is replaced with thesis, then what what happens? Where where would materiality be? Um, can I continue or one at a time? Uh, one. At a time. We, I will relinquish my question to someone who is <laughs> familiar with. No 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 no. I think just go go go. go. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so I'm, I'm, first of all, thank you, all three of you, but inspired also by um, Anna's wonderful comments, I'm uh, wondering whether an icon, a book, a printed book in this case, and a cultural object or a cultural space like a church acts also really like that of an icon, right? Because of that absence, right? It is always bringing into presence um, that absence Absence actually could never be experienced without a material object in a way. Mm -hmm. And that um, Sebu, I mean, the, the printing book in diaspora is clearly also from the other chapters that I've read of your manuscript, um, shaped, um, generated because of the absence of actually the apostolical church in diaspora. And in some ways, at least the book um, theological litur litur books of liturgy fill that kind of absence. And then mm -hmm. it's also maybe important to think about in that absence uh, in Madras, Masalan, um, or in Amsterdam, uh, how does a book that is printed, that is read, um, and it is liturgical and theological in base actually creates that direct connection with God that an icon could have. Thank you. I think that we have about three minutes. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, do you want to take a stab at your question? No, yeah, you go first. Uh, I'll be very quick with uh, response with respect to uh, Murat's question. Why did I stop in 1800? Well, the, the, the short answer is at the risk of putting my foot in my mouth, which my wife always points points out to. Uh, I think, like Nina Garsoyan, but. 400 years later, that, that history <laughs> stops in 1800 <laughs> and it's all uh, journalism and political science afterwards. Now, of course, being in such an august <laughs> company here with so many smart theorists right. and so on, I would say uh, that uh, it's a personal bias. My interest is in the early modern period. I don't like history when it becomes a downward luge for every, almost practically every group in the, on the planet with the exception of a few select benef, benef, uh, beneficiaries. Uh, I just, I, I find the early modern period so much more interesting and I arbitrarily cut it there because it's also the period of the hand press in printing. It's a distinct period that ends with the coming of the lighter um, steel presses in the 18, early 1800s. Uh, so that's my answer to you, but I'd, I'd love to talk to you more about the armeno turkish uh, material, and I do agree that the trends continue into the, until the 19th century, and it's only after the post tanzimat era that you do sig witness a significant difference. It's only 100 years later, so, uh, but that's to be tabled for another time. As for Catherine and uh, 
Um, Anna, I would say, yes, books are very important material objects, but they're special kinds of material objects. They are what Anthony Grafton calls semiotic objects. They actually circulate and are mobile, and in the process of doing so, they transform the reader with whom they uh, come into contact. In that sense, they do have an agency, but the agency is equally that of the reader as well. Um, I will, I'll end it there because Thank you very much, everybody. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, sorry? I, I don't know. Um, no history after. <laughs> it's for her. It's no time. history yeah. after. Okay, <laughs> please don't. Oh, John, I thought it was going to be off the book. Kevor, thank you. That's a, that's a, a, a tough question. Um, I mean, you, the, the first, the sort of dodging answer is that, um, you know, I'm, I'm looking kind of at the uptake of Cyril in Armenian theology, which, you know, is, is a, a defender as opposed to a, a kind of detractor of, of, of Cyril. Um, you know, the beginning of a longer, this is, I think this is a great and important question, and I'm, I'm, I have the, the inklings of a, another sort of, my, my Christology and series, you know, Christology and semiotics, Christology and materiality. The other one is Christology and personhood, actually, right? So thinking about, you know, contemporary debates about human rights if you have a different conception of person. And so I think, you know, what you're pointing to is, is that um, these, these categories that are used <laughs> You know, highly philosophical categories used to talk about the, the person of Christ um, really do speak to these these questions. You know, so personhood, nature is another one. I mean, I allude to that by bringing in environmental concerns as well, right? The idea of what we mean by by nature can can help us frame our debates about you know contemporary environmental crises. Um, so that's a that's a, a slightly longer answer, but I, I think that. Um, you know, one way to, to look at it is that, you know, whether or not he got it right, um, you know, what Armenians have done with it is one thing. And the other thing is that I think that it's worth thinking about these kind of confusions and, and arguments about how he, he uses these, you know, I mean, one of the things that is said about some of the Eastern, you know, Oriental Eastern theology is that they just didn't understand these Greek philosophical concepts, right? This has been one of the arguments is that, oh, the actual difference over Chalcedon is simply that those, you know, those poor, backward, you know, uh, hunt-loving, you know, semi-nomadic Armenians don't understand the, the niceties of what, you know, hypostasis means, for instance. Um, so I, I think there's a lot to be done there that I, I can do a little even more deeper theology to get at that. Um, I think that's largely dodging the question, but uh, it points points in the, in the in a very important direction. So thank you for it. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, I'd like. Oh, yeah, sorry. well, that's okay. Okay. <laughs> I know it's late, but I'll be I'll be very quick. So I want to thank you for your comments and Catherine's comments. Indeed, actually, um, it, it the, these spaces emerge out of negotiations. So it's different in Lebanon and in the U.S., for example. So in my experience in Lebanon, for example. They would tell, so feeling the, we, uh, Catherine asked about, tell, talked about feeling the absence. So the absence is filled by a trilogy in Lebanon, which is the club, the church, and the school. These three are important for maintaining the Armenianness in Lebanon. While the, you don't see that in, in the United States because the absence can be filled only by churches and some minor uh, like discursive spaces that are emerging but are not as prolific compared to Lebanon. So it's always within and it's always being negotiated in a changing conditions in various international, local, uh, well, different different conditions. So that's um, one of the point, that's one of the brief remarks I wanted to make. I'll hold the second. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.